الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد respected brothers our topic has been now running for several days and i hope that we have been able to establish for our own benefit and the, for the benefit of our children our family certain narratives those narratives might not meet or stand up to what could be the prevailing attitudes out there but that should not be our concern that should not be our concern our concern should be that my values my principles what i stand up for does it meet the criteria of sharia does it please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does it confirm to the quran and sunnah that's what we should look at that's what should be our priority and up to now we've been looking at our sons suitable career sensible career halal livelihood a livelihood a job a profession that allows them to breathe and live as well at the same time we also looked in the over the last two days that what type of partner spouse wife do you want for your son and what your son also should aspire for at the same time our daughters we also need to think that what do we want for our daughters what should be our priority what is our priority and what should really be our priority do you want just a career for them so they go out and they get educated and educated like i mentioned the other day they become over qualified and sometimes they reach such a point in their life that they could reach the age of 27 28 and they find it difficult to get married because their objective has been the career and usually if you pursue a career it's the first 7 8 years that are crucial where you've got to build yourself and you've got to prove yourself for a man to prove himself in the workplace is far easier for women it's far different you all know the reality it's out there it's black and white it's in the news as well we hear about it every now and then so do you want a career for your daughter or do you want for her a happy family family life do you want her to be happily married and you know i'll just give you one little example sometimes your daughter could be at the peak of her career she's 27 28 29 you know every time you might even start touching upon the topic and subject of nikah and marriage she ignores it and maybe you're touching upon it a little bit too late as well okay what did we discuss the other day once she reaches the age of 27 you're in the amber zone you're in the amber zone and 28 29 is definitely the red zone It becomes very difficult because we'll discuss this in detail the pool of boys available for that girl it decreases because most of them are married and the ones that will be left over you know they might not be basically suitable for her basically or she might not be suitable for them i'm sure you can read between the lines so she might be at the peak of her career and she hits 30 31 maybe even 32 and this is the norm nowadays for some people and what then happens is allah na kare one of her parents passes away in particular the mother in particular the mother let's say she was to pass away basically this girl at the peak of her career and within her basically parents home most probably living with parents she you know this thought never even crossed her that i need to get married i need to start a family i need to settle down but now the reality hits her because 
that support, that pillar she had in her life is no longer there. You know, before she had someone to talk to, relate to, etc. That person, that significant person in her life, no longer there, now the reality hits her. And sometimes it can be a little bit too late. And we've discussed this. So parents, you know, it all starts from the parents. Parents from a young age, we need to mold and guide our children. If you leave it to them, oh, they will make the decision or we'll look at it when it, the time comes, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, that type of attitude. If you have that type of attitude, then basically it's very hard to change and mold someone once they're firmly set in their views. Very difficult. This type of nurturing and tarbiya starts from a you know, very early age. And can uh, women uh, have it all, you know, career, family, etc. I gave you the result of this report yesterday. Okay, not written by me, written by Western academics. They themselves say, no, you can't have it all. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that, basically. And the other question is, for our daughters, you know, for the son, he's got to be the breadwinner. We've made that very clear from the first day. Sharia has stated that the man, the son, he is the breadwinner for the family. It's his job to provide. It's his job to put a shelter over the family. It's his job to put food on the table. So when it comes to our daughters, parents need to think, how far do I want to go with her career, with her education? And potentially at what cost? And there's no straight answer. I'm not going to give you an answer for this. Every person needs to decide for themselves how far you want to go, where you weigh everything. We've been discussing this topic for seven, eight days now. You know, you've looked at it from many different angles and you've, uh, we've explored so many different issues and topics. You need to decide for yourself how far do I want to go? And if you are choosing, you know, an option which is balanced, where Dean is at the forefront, then you need to basically nurture. We need to nurture our daughters from a young age, from the age of 12, 13, 14, maybe even slightly earlier. It's no point talking about these things when she's hit 18, 19, 20. It's no point. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. So you need to build the mindset. You need to basically carry out tarbiyah and nurturing from a very early age. That look, Nikra, this is what we want. This is our aspirations for you. And these aspirations, they are basically good for you. From a worldly perspective, from a dini perspective, from a spiritual perspective, it might not be the same as your friends. It might not be same as the prevalent narrative out there. But wallahi, this is good for you. And then you get your daughter. You know, you get those type of people to talk to her and rub shoulders with her who have the same mindset, who share the same aspirations. Obviously, you might have good aspirations, but if you're not going to give her that environment or uh, uh, those type of friends, relatives, etc., who can encourage her the way you want her to, you know, that's the second step so that she understands that it's not just my parents who are saying this. Actually, there's other people out there who also subscribe to this narrative. So like I said, I'm not going to say how far you should be going with her career, how far you should be going with her education. You know, some people say that a girl, she should choose that type of career which might help her. You know, career means education. Don't uh, misread when I say career. Uh, I, I totally uh, basically disagree with that career which basically puts your family life at risk and everything else at risk, what we've been discussing, not in that context, but that type of education some people say that maybe that might benefit her after married life. And they give examples of nursing, education, uh, teaching, that type of thing. Wallahu a'lam. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not agreeing with that. I thought I'll just put it um, uh, in front of you, um, basically. Because the bottom line is, the breadwinner is the husband. The breadwinner is the boy. It's his responsibility. At no point should there be any obligation on our daughters to be a breadwinner or one of the breadwinners. That comes to a second issue. 
which we hear again and again that, oh, girls have to go to work nowadays. Why? What's that famous slogan? Two incomes. You know, one income is not enough. One income is not enough. Allah bait, wake up a bit. Who said one income is not enough? There's so many people surviving on one income. So many people. You know, I'll give you an example. Those of you sitting here, my age, our parents, when they came to this country, they did not just have to support themselves. They did not just have to support themselves and their children. They also would send money back home for parents, for siblings. And they still used to manage. In fact, many of them, you know, with their meager savings and their, what do you call it, labor-intensive jobs. And you can understand the income you would get from a labor-intensive job. Not very average. Not grand, not great. On that income, they survived. They bought you up and me up. They gave you shelter. They gave you food. They performed hajj. They took their parents for hajj. And God knows how many more members of their family they supported back home. On that very income. And today we are saying, oh, one income does not suffice. It all comes back to, you know, You know, the Quran says very clearly, the hallmarks of a believer, When they spend, they don't waste. At the same time, They're neither stingy. They're in between. They're in between. We need to adopt the middle course. If basically... You and your wife, you've got the habit. You know, you chose a wife, you went for that interview and your son, you know, she said holiday. So he nodded his head. I want to go out to eat every week. He nods his head. He signed up to everything. Of course, one income is not going to suffice. I'll give you a small example. If you're eating out, take away once a week, twice a week. Okay. And, you know, at certain age, you probably realize that it's not the best food. Okay. It's for jagdas. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, maybe, I don't know till what age you realize that that pleads uh, which I was enjoying, Ya Allah, Al Aman, Wal Hafiz. Okay? But anyway, if you're eating out once or twice a week and then that's takeaway, and then you want to go to a um, restaurant maybe every other week, twice a month, three times a month, just that bill, come on, monthly, how much would it be? Someone tell me. Yeah, 250, 300 easily. Okay, let's take a conservative figure. Let's just take 200. 200 pounds is still a lot of money. Okay? On the other hand, cooking a nice chicken curry at home with all the trappings and toppings, how much is that going to cost? Or am I asking the wrong audience? Come on, man. A rough estimate. Hussein, come on. No, one meal. Must be a very big chicken, that. Okay, five people, Chalo, five people. Okay, I, I get that, I get that. So basically, one meal at home, okay, it costs you maybe 10, 12 pounds to cook. 10, 12 pounds, no more. Okay? And, mashallah, if you've got big appetite, sell under pound, idea. Okay? Now compare that to a bill of 200 pounds a month just to eat out two, three times. So we're not even counting the other meals. Okay? Just compare that. There is no comparison. There is no comparison. So of course, you need two incomes. Of course, that girl, your daughter has to go out and work to provide for the family. Because one income is not sufficient. And, you know, we should have these conversations with our children. And we should teach our children to sometimes adopt you know, a certain level of simplicity in their life. You know, alhamdulillah, you might be loaded. Okay? Allah has given you. There's no guarantee that your child is going to follow in the same footsteps. And if you give them a taste of a certain life, you know, with no understanding, no appreciation, later on in life, they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle. Wallahi. Things they take for granted, suddenly, if they were deprived from that, they're going to struggle. And of course, one income is not going to be sufficient. And then there's other issues as well. You know, when a person gets married, a boy gets married, 
the issue of house, etc. Okay, he, girls want to, like I said yesterday, that uh, living alone is non-negotiable. That's something, you know, you don't even start your negotiation with that. That's something which is done, dusted, understood. By default, it's there. So there's, of course, he needs to get onto the property ladder, etc. There's those type of issues as well. But I don't have time to go into um, detail on that. But just to conclude, just to conclude on this, that first of all, we've looked at the boy, we've looked at the girl. And I've not given you any answers when it comes to our daughter's education, career, etc. You need to decide how far you want to go, what your priorities are. Rasulullah on the issue of nikah, he also said that a person should get married as soon as they are able to. Okay, as soon as they are able to. The more you delay, a person can fall into sin as well. It's not just the boy as well, it's girls as well. They can fall into sin as well. Usually when we think of this type of sin, our basically mind only goes to the boys. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said that Ya ma'ashar al-shabab man istata'a minkum ul-ba'ata fal yatazawwaj O youngsters, the one who from you is able to get married fal yatazawwaj, he should get married. He should not delay. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gives the reason فَإِنَّهُ أَغَضُّ لِلْبَصَرْ وَأَحْصَنُ لِلْفَرْجِ It basically lowers your gaze. You know, when a person enters nikah with the right reasons, and he has halal lawful means to fulfill his carnal desires, it should help him control his gaze, basically. He should not look at someone else with desire, with lust. And the other is that it protects his private parts, i.e. protects him from zina. His nikah is a source of basically protecting him from zina. You know, first, Rasulullah mentioned basar. You know, the eye, we hear again and again, Sahmum min suhumi shaitan. It's an arrow from the arrows, you know, the most poisonous arrow from the arrows of shaitan. Everything starts with the gaze. Nothing comes before the gaze. It's the gaze, that's where things start off from. And then other parts of the body advance the sin till either basically uh, uh, the farj either fulfills that desire and falls into zina or basically it rejects it. These are, this is the mafhum of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then Prophet sallallahu said that, okay, somebody is not able to get married for whatever reason. Okay, maybe financially they're not ready. Maybe they cannot afford to um, look after uh, a wife or support her. The one who can't get married for whatever reason, for whatever reason, you know, he, he should fast. He should fast. Why? You know, it's the month of Ramadan. There's no better time to relate to than fasting than this month. That when a person is fasting, come on, when it hits three o'clock, four o'clock, how do you feel? Come on, guys, tell me. Tired. Tired. You feel tired. Your body naturally feels tired. When a person's tired, you know, usko masti sujdi hai? No. Basically. So, som is a type of barrier. A barrier to help you keep away from zina, to keep away from sins, etc. To help you control your desires and your carnal desires. Rasulullah say, says that, فَعَلَيْهِ بِسَّوْمْ فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ وِجَا It's a shield. It's a protective shield uh, uh, for you. That's why you need to fast. And obviously adopt other means as well. Fasting is probably the, the, the biggest uh, protective shield uh, you could adopt. And it's very important that once our child is ready for nikah, we don't delay. You know, what's happening nowadays is that, okay, nikah, uh, you were fixed up at the age of whatever. And then for two years, nikah is not taking place. Ya Allah. And the boy and girl are talking, meeting, and to the extent they're even going on holidays together. Ya Allah. You know, just think to yourself, you know, if you are a father of a daughter, where's your sharam? Where's your gherat gone? That how can you allow your daughter out of nikah to go out with someone on a holiday or shopping or to Trafford Center or to Manchester or wherever, basically. 
Allah buy just do nikah. End of story. You don't need to hire imperial and do big dawat. Okay, and call 500 people. No. Just do nikah. That step of nikah, that small step, but it has such a huge significance. It makes your relationship halal and lawful. End of story. Just do nikah. And really, I, I really uh, admire those parents that, you know, sometimes what happens is that, uh, you know, and it's becoming more and more frequent, a boy finds his own partner. I mean, it's very common. It's very common. If that does happen, and, you know, there's really no grounds for you to object. You know, the partner, alhamdulillah, is suitable, etc. Dindar, whatever, you know, you, you know, you haven't got really any grounds to object. You should not delay in doing the nikah. Get the nikah done. And you know, taqdeer. Whatever Allah has written for them, destiny, it's going to happen. But at least you've done your bit. That chalo, do your nikah. At least make your relationship lawful. You know, as soon as it hits your ears and you've carried out a bit of due diligence, you should not delay in doing the right thing. And telling your son or your daughter or whoever it is, that this is what we are going to do because this is what is correct. And everything else, it doesn't matter what other people say, it's incorrect. And just to conclude today, you know, what's the objective of nikah? You know, is objective of nikah some sort of financial contract only? Where I mentioned the other day, a boy goes to see a girl and she has a whole list. I want this, I want this yearly holiday. I want to be able to go holiday with my friends. I want this, I want that. Basically, you know, how much are you earning? Is that the be-all and end-all of nikah? No. That, that shouldn't even be in the equation. Yes, your husband should be able to support yourself. That should be a priority. And that should definitely be a, that should be a consideration. Okay? Quran says that وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Quran clearly tells us what's the objective of nikah. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا That you find peace, comfort, tranquility in your partner, in your wife. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا In another verse of the Quran, that وَجَعَلَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا لِيَسْكُنَ إِلَيْهَا Again, the same message. That nikah is about two people coming together, where they are a source of comfort, happiness, and joy for one another. You know, a support for one another. And I'll give you a very good example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. That, you know, when the first revelation came to him, the first revelation came to him and Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam came to him in the cave. And the very first time Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at him, he was full of fear. And Jibreel alayhi salam is saying to him that basically, Iqra, read. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, Ma'ana bi qari'in. I am not a reader. I'm not a reciter, basically. So, and then Jibreel Islam squeezes him and gives him this instruction again and again, two, three times, till in the end he uh, re reads, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, the first few verses of this surah. What happens to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He's full of fear. He's scared. And what does he do? He immediately goes home to his wife, Khadija radiyallahu anha. Khadija radiyallahu anha does not have the true understanding of what's happened. She was not there. She, did, you know, she cannot even appreciate what Rasulullah has been through. The, the burden of wahi, the burden of revelation, the reality of seeing Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam. You know, this is so overwhelming for someone who has never ever experienced this before. For someone to relate to this is even more difficult. Despite that, despite that, Khadija radiyallahu ta'ala anha, you know, what's her reaction? Her reaction is exactly what we just looked at, that لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا لِيَسْكُنَ إِلَيْهَا She becomes a source of comfort for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes into the house saying, زَمِّلُونِي زَمِّلُونِي You know, he was... Uh, trembling with fright and fear. So he goes, cover me, cover me. Zammiluni, zammiluni. Hazrat Aisha radiyallahu anha covers him. And then when he narrates what's happened, Khadija radiyallahu anha, and he says, لَقَدْ خَشِيتُ عَلَى نَفْسِي 
No, I feared for my life. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi said this was such a experience that I actually feared for my life. Laqad khashitu ala nafsi. What does Khadija radiyallahu ta'ala anha say? Kalla, never. Meaning, Ya Rasulullah. Remember, he, obviously he's not attained prophethood as yet formally in the eyes of the people. But, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She says, Kalla, never. Wallahi, ma yahzunuka Allahu abada. You know, God, Allah, you know, they used to believe in a God, Allah, in, in some sort of super deity. God will never ever put you to waste. God will never ever put you to waste. Why? And she says, Innaka latasilu rahim. You know, you've got such great qualities inside you. Look at, you know, the, the, the bigger picture here. She's being a source of comfort for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, Ajkal ni wife, if you told her, you know, I had a very scary dream. Oh, just get on with it. Well, whatever. Do you understand? Okay? Do you understand Jack Amper Jadu? Basically. Look at Khadija radiyallahu anha's response. You know, she comforts him. She tells him that Allah will never ever basically deprive you or put you through any grief. And then she gives the reasons as well. Innaka la tasilu rahim. That you are the one who maintains the ties of kinship with your relatives. And... Silatul Rahim is a big quality. It's an important quality. It's an important characteristic. And then she gives other examples. That you help the poor, the needy. So, you know, these were Prophet Sallallahu characteristics before. Before prophethood. That maintaining family ties, helping the poor, helping the needy. And some say that... Uh, uh, one of these kal or ma'dum is like someone who's a laborer but not earning enough to support themselves. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would make it a habit of helping them as well. And wa daif, you know, when somebody, some, when guests come to you, you know, you are extremely hospitable. Nowadays, if some, you find out a mehman coming, especially the girls of nowadays, the wives of nowadays, ya Allah. You'll be hearing about it five days prior and after they've come and gone, another five days. And she'll have a headache for five days prior and post and uh, pre, basically, visit. Ya Allah. And for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi you know, hospitality, being hospitable to guests. And this was a shi'ar of the Arabs. That if a guest came to their house, they would, you know, leave everything and attend to the guest. And they would receive the best of the food they would have. So Khadija radiyallahu anha and then to, wa tu'inu ala nawa'ib al-haq that you know you also help out on, in those issues which are of concern to the community which, are, which basically matter uh, ala nawa'ib al-haq and then Khadija radiyallahu ta'ala anha doesn't stop there. Her comforting does not stop there. What does she do? She then takes him to her cousin Waraqa bin Nawfar who basically had accepted Christianity. So he was a Christian, meaning he was a man of faith. He was a man of faith. So she takes him to Waraqa bin Nawfal and Waraqa bin Nawfal as a man of faith, you know, who, had, who was educated in the scriptures. Straight away he recognizes that this is the final prophet. So can you see the point I was making, that objective of nikah, our youngsters also need to understand maqasidun nikah. And just to conclude on this, we'll carry on with this tomorrow. It's Saturday today, so I thought I will take a few minutes extra. But just to conclude, you know, a few years ago, when people used to say that we should have a workshop for those people who are 18, 19 years old, you know, well before they are going to get married, I used to think, yeah, wait, who workshop Karani Nika, Haru, and marriage, and this and that. But now, the times we are living in, and with the changing of mentalities and priorities and attitudes, I feel this is actually very important. In fact, one workshop is not enough. There should be a series of workshops, five, six workshops over the course of maybe 10 weeks where young people, male and female, should both attend and they should be given this type of education, tarbiya and nurturing. And they should appreciate and understand the objectives of nikah. You know, before I used to think there's not really much need for it. But now, if you look at the current um, attitudes out there and all the different examples we see in front of us some which, which are very unfortunate and very disheartening I feel this is very important and as a community 
as a community, we should make provision for this. We should identify the need and we should approach the ulama and scholars and we should say that we need to do this. You know, the initiative should come from the community, not just from the scholars and the imams. You know, they've got plenty going on without adding one more thing to their uh, job list. Jazakallah subhanakallahumma bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaha.